So, all right, welcome everybody to uh, this month's uh, ESOMI webinar. It's uh, a pleasure to have you all here, and it's a special pe pleasure for us to have Tessa Cook here, who's certainly well known, and uh, I'm looking very forward to it. And I'll pass the mic to my co host, Pinar, who will give you a short introduction and then uh, we'll start right off. Uh, just a quick note you can always. Um, post your questions uh, to the chat or to the Q&A section. We'll monitor that and we'll have a discussion afterwards. And uh, so, yeah, Pinar, please. Thank you, Daniel. Um, we, today we have uh, Tessa Cook. She is an assistant professor of radiology at the Perelman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia uh, for our, our webinar. Uh, she has an amazing CV and a strong background in imaging informatics and has worked in quantitative image processing in the Pan Image Computing and Science Laboratory. She's further a developer of Radiance, which is an open source software pipeline for CT radiation exposure and also an active member of multiple radiology societies like RSNA, ACR, SIM and AUR. Last year, Dr. Cook was in the inducted into the College of SIM Fellows and received an award for the advancement of women in medical imaging informatics. And currently uh, she has an academic appointment in radiology and besides her clinical work, focus on research in imaging informatics and health services. She and her team uh, were award awarded one of the first grants uh, from the Penn Center for Healthcare Innovation in order to develop and study an automated radiology recommendation tracking engine. And our major focus is to uh, pursue the innovative methods to improve the workflow of radiologists, as well as optimize the deliver delivery of longitudinal patient care in radiology. So we are very delighted to see what's your perspective um, for AI in radiology practice uh, from all over the uh, other side of the world for us uh, the, for, from, from the US. Uh, the floor is yours. You know, and Daniel, thank you so much for that very nice introduction. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm delighted to join you all today to talk about uh, AI and radiology some of the unique aspects of practicing healthcare in the US that have impacted uh, our experience with AI and uh, tell you a little bit about some of the lessons that we've learned along the way. Uh, I have leadership roles that I hold in a variety of radiology organizations. I have some grant funding and my department has some vendor agreements. Uh, I may discuss some of the organizations that I uh, have these leadership roles in in the course of this presentation. So despite the dire predictions for, for the fate of radiology and radiologists uh, some years ago, uh, we are stronger than ever as a specialty and radiology AI is here. And, uh, and the more we learn about it, the more we realize the potential that it has to help us improve the care that we deliver to our patients. And if you haven't started thinking about how AI fits into the radiology workflow, you are not too late. Uh, but now is certainly the time to, to start to consider how it might help and uh, where it might fit in. The thing that maybe makes it a little bit tricky is that there are so many potential use cases for imaging AI and radiology AI in particular we generate all kinds of data in clinical practice, whether it is pixel-based data, report-based data, EMR data, uh, or even billing data. And there are use cases for AI to affect all of those. The one we most hear about, or the two that we hear most about, they're certainly related, are AI for findings detection, which is a, a pixel-based task, uh, looking for an abnormality on an imaging exam, uh, whether that might be something that impacts the patient's health in the immediate few minutes to hours or even further down the road. Uh, and particularly for that first type of finding, uh, case triage. So actually modifying the radiologist's work list to bring those studies with uh, acute or life-threatening abnormalities up higher on the list so the radiologist will see them more quickly. But there are so many other use cases for non-pixel-based data. 
Uh, one that I'm particularly excited about because I spend a lot of my clinical time looking through the medical record to try to find information about the patient's previous workup or the clinical indication for the study that I'm currently looking at or information to inform how to perform the next study that the patient's about to have. I, I would love to have an AI that could do some smart searching, some contextual inquiry of the, the electronic medical record and feed me all of the relevant information rather than me having to go out and search for it. Even in the way that we generate our interpretations, oftentimes we, we need a little bit of quality control, but there's also areas for improvement to generate reports that are specific to the audience that is receiving them, whether it might be the primary care physician that's kind of broadly managing everything that's going on with the patient, or the specialists that are going to manage the next steps in the patient's care, or even the patient or their caregiver uh, and, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had AI that could take a sort of core interpretation, which may be very quantitative in some ways, but also have a lot of qualitative description and parcel out the parts that are relevant to the different stakeholders and the different recipients. AI can be used and is already used in, in some forms to optimize scheduling of patients to make sure that patients can get their exams when they need to. Uh, and also to make sure that our modalities, our imaging equipment are uh, being used to the, to the maximum capacity uh, that is reasonable. But we could certainly optimize schedules, not only for our patients, but also for staffing our, our radiology practices. And I know uh, that there are some instances of, of that uh, in the literature of uh, using AI in creative ways. Protocoling is, is something that we do uh, being an academic practice. Um, for uh, advanced imaging in uh, helping guide our technologists to perform the, the study in such a way that it answers the clinical question or has the potential to answer the clinical question. Um, but as I mentioned a few minutes ago, you know, this often to me means that I am looking at uh, all parts of the medical record to try to get more information. And wouldn't it be great if uh, for some exams that are more straightforward or for which we have enough prior data that an AI could be trained to actually take some of those more straightforward cases off of our plate. Uh, billing is uh, certainly something that's very complex here in the US healthcare system. And uh, we have the concept of a relative value unit, which is essentially how the effort that a physician puts into a procedure uh, is, is uh, monetized or, or a value, a dollar value is assigned to that effort. And uh, there are some examples of AI being used to, to help to optimize all of that billing data and, and make it uh, uh, more insightful to actually, to actually get more meaningful information out of all of that, uh, out of all of that data. Uh, results and follow-up, communi results communication and follow-up management, there's enormous potential for, for AI to play a role here. And we've seen a number of examples of this in, in the research space as well as in uh, the vendor community uh, in keeping patients from falling through the cracks who um, may come back later with an undiagnosed cancer or an avoidable complication. And so again, this requires uh, analysis of data in creative ways. And I think there's real opportunity here for, for AI to make an impact. And I think the last use case that I find particularly exciting because it's not something that we're able to do terribly well today is to take all of the information that we have now and actually predict future development of disease. And this is sort of the, the holy grail, if you will, of, uh, of imaging AI to take pixel-based data, non-pixel-based data, uh, data from the medical record and uh, make a prediction based on what we know today about development of disease in the future. So I think there are many really exciting use cases and um, to help to catalog these, the uh, American College of Radiology's Data Science Institute, the DSI, actually has uh, an online directory that they are actively updating. It's called Define AI, which actually is a collection of use cases for uh, AI developers looking to better understand specific clinical needs and, uh, and use cases. There's a large number of interpretive use cases that are available uh, on the uh, Define AI page, but also a number of non-interpretive use cases. So everything that you could consider that could be business facing. So we talked about billing and RVU management. 
uh, non-interpretive uh, patient-facing use cases, things that impact population health, uh, workflow in the reading room, workflow for the technologists. And there's even a few recently that are related to COVID in particular, uh, surge planning during the pandemic, as well as restarting imaging-based screening. So mammography and lung cancer screening uh, in the setting of the pandemic. So a lot of really useful information there. Now with this wealth of, of use cases, there must be tons of AI out in the clinical workflow, right? I mean, since there's so many applications, potential applications, we must all be using it. So to answer that question, uh, Dr. Keith Dreyer of the, the DSI led uh, an AI use survey last year. And one of the questions basically asked uh, ACR members what proportion of them were using or how many of them rather were using some form of AI in their practice and not specifically deep learning, machine learning, but anything that could be considered artificial intelligence. And uh, I realize I don't have a, a, a great way of doing uh, audience response here. However, uh, I will um, ask you to think about what you think the answer to that question is in, in your own heads. Uh, and I'll tell you that the answer was 30%. And for some of you that may seem high, for some of you that may strike you as unusually low, uh, but I found that, uh, you know, I, I found it helpful that we were at least able to quantify that number through the, uh, through the ACR survey. And again, this is all kinds of AI, right? Everything from conventional machine learning uh, to, to um, advanced deep learning and certainly both pixel-based and non-pixel-based. So, you know, why is it only 30%? If you thought that that number was low, there are many real world reasons that uh, we'll actually address in this presentation. But I think in part, it has to do with getting a better understanding of what AI is available and what it can do. And certainly the, the resources uh, on the DSI's website uh, address some of that as well. But I've definitely encountered sort of broadly two categories. Uh, one group of radiologists that says, no, you know what? I don't really need AI. I, I do what I do and I do it well. And um, you know, I, I'm not sure um, what this new technology really adds. And then I've encountered another group of folks that, that can't get their hands on it fast enough. I, I would like, you know, and I, I perhaps I'm a little bit in that category myself. You know, I have this list of things I want the AI to do for me. Um, but certainly we have to understand sort of what the technology can't do and perhaps more importantly, what it cannot do. And that's very much an ongoing process. Um, I was fortunate to be part of, of this effort that was led by Dr. Raim Geis a couple of years ago. Uh, to develop a multi-society statement about the ethics of AI and radiology. USOMI was represented here, the ESR, the Canadian Association of Radiologists, and certainly multiple uh, US-based radiology organizations. And, and there's a, a statement in, in that paper that says that transparency, interpretability, and explainability are necessary to build patient and provider trust. And I think that has a lot to do with that 30% number that we're seeing. You know, this is relatively new technology uh, and there may be some hesitancy uh, in, in getting it into clinical practice for the reasons that, you know, when it's presented as sort of this black box of data goes in and some conclusion comes out and not a whole lot of understanding as to why, naturally there's hesitation. So there's, there's real value in making AI explainable. And I think we've really seen work in that direction in the last couple of years, um, but it's gonna take time to get radiologists and other physicians to, to trust this, this new technology and really understand that it can benefit patients. It's also important to consider the performance characteristics specific to each AI use case, and also to consider the fact that you don't necessarily just pick one of these off the shelf and put it in your workflow and, and then you're, you're all set. Um, that you might actually need to tune the AI to your data to get the best performance. And we see a, a variety of uh, metrics for AI performance in the literature, you know, recall, which is sensitivity, precision, which is positive predictive value, the F1 score, which is a harmonic mean of the two, accuracy as well. But, but that doesn't necessarily tell the whole story, right? Because 
there's a cost to a false negative or a false positive, and the cost may be different depending on the use case. You know, in the setting of uh, an AI that may not necessarily be flagging a life-threatening finding, an immediately life-threatening finding, a high number of false positives can maybe frustrate the radiologist and create more work for them. But on the other hand, uh, an AI that is dealing with potentially life-threatening diagnoses uh, should have a very, we should have very low tolerance for, for false negatives in that situation because the price of an error is harm to the patient. And so AI is really not one size fits all in, in that sense. And it's something to, to keep in mind. The other consideration too is the data. You know, was the AI that we're considering using trained on the right data to solve the problem? Where were the labels sourced from? How many labels were there? How much data was there? Uh, <clears throat> and is there inherent bias in the data that we have to consider? In other words, does the data that will come from the population that the AI will be used on clinically resemble the data on which it was trained? Or are there particular aspects and differences that are going to cause harm to patients uh, as a result of the differences in the training? This is a, a real question that we're looking at. Bias in AI doesn't just come from the data, certainly, but the data is one source of it. And it's very important for those of you out there that are training AI to make sure that that the, that the training data is sufficiently representative or that additional training is, is done if the data, if the model rather is to be used in, in a population that's different because we run the risk of disadvantaging patients uh, if we're not careful about this. There was nice work from uh, folks at Stanford at the end of last year looking at where the data comes from, the image data specifically that's currently being used to train uh, AI in the US. And they found that there was definitely a uh, predisposition for data coming from three states in the country, from California, Massachusetts, and New York. And you know, you have to raise the question of, is the data from patients in these three states, West Coast and East Coast, not really representing the middle of the country at all, representative, sufficiently representative of any patient anywhere in the US, even though this is the source of the data that's actually being used to train the models that ultimately could be used anywhere in the US. So all of these are sort of high level considerations. And then when you think about actually how to get AI into the clinical workflow, you start to ask even more questions. And I, I promise I have answers to some, but maybe not to all of them. So when you think about deploying AI in the clinical workflow, you know, I, I would love to tell you that it is entirely straightforward. You decide which AI you want, you figure out the steps to actually get it, you put it in, you use it, and you're finished. Um, but as we know, nothing is truly quite that straightforward, and it is highly likely that there are going to be a number of uh, dependencies and a number of steps that uh, are going to require more effort or less effort. And so more recently, I've started to think about AI deploy, uh, AI in the clinical workflow in terms of these three phases. You know, the pre-deployment phase where you have to do all of that planning to actually get the tool into the workflow, the actual deployment where you're essentially, you know, plugging in all the pieces literally and figuratively, um, and then the post-deployment monitoring, which is so very important. And I think this is the area where we're still learning a lot. And so every step of this needs careful monitoring and planning and someone to own the process. And for, for the IT uh, experts that might be involved in this, it may not necessarily be identical to other software or hardware rollouts. And, and it's worth sort of calling attention to that at the very beginning. So in terms of who makes the imaging decisions, it's so very important that you get all your stakeholders at the table from the beginning. Otherwise, you might end up with this perception that someone is trying to get in someone else's way or, or you know, creating these roadblocks, which there are naturally going to be roadblocks and barriers that are encountered, but better to get all of the necessary stakeholders together at the table at the beginning. And, and who are those stakeholders? Well, at minimum, there's a domain expert. And, and note that I'm not even just saying radiologist, I'm not even saying just physician. Uh, it, we have non-radiology physician colleagues that are part of this process. But again, depending on the use case, your domain expert might be a physicist if it's a 
uh, you know, an AI that's going to affect the acquisition process. It might be a technologist as well. So it really depends on the use case, but whoever it is, it has to be a domain expert. And, and that asterisk is there on the slide to remind you that not only do they need to be the expert, they need to champion the process. So their involvement is not just from the beginning or at the beginning rather, but it is throughout the entire process, even post-deployment um, to make sure that the AI is working correctly. You need to get your IT and information security partners involved early, certainly the informaticists who know what needs, what systems need to talk to what and how. Um, sometimes the AI that you're deploying is not uh, a vendor product. It's actually something that's been developed in the research space. And again, I am at a, an academic institution. And so my research colleagues develop AI and want to, to evaluate it in the clinical workflow. And, uh, and so they need to be involved in these conversations as well. Our data science colleagues are part of this effort um, and certainly our administration who have to be concerned with how to pay the bills, which is a very real part of this. And speaking of the bills, you know, how much of a practice's budget should be spent on AI? It's, it's really a hard question to answer because every practice is a little bit different in that way. Uh, the, the return on investment can be quantified in different ways. Is it increased radiologist efficiency? Is it decreased turnaround time? Is it increased accuracy, improved patient safety? Uh, and how do you translate all of those things to actual dollar amounts? Now, I'll tell you in the US, there's, uh, there's been a recent uh, reimbursement paradigm that, that kind of surprised a lot of us that, that now factors into this, uh, into this discussion. And I'll, I'll touch on that in the next section of the talk. But these are really real world considerations. And you know, every, uh, every vendor has a little bit of a different approach when it comes to their um, cost model, you know, whether it's a subscription service, the number of users, the number of sites, the number of studies, et cetera. And for some practices, you know, some of that cost may be prohibitive for others not, and it might even be, you know, a model to model difference depending on, on the kind of uh, on the kind of AI we're talking about. And so, uh, again, not certainly not a one size fits all and not, uh, not an easy question to answer. As far as where you're going to put the AI, you know, again, I, I feel like I keep saying it's not one size fits all because it's really not. Uh, every AI or every radiology workflow is a little bit different. You know, I'm a cardiovascular radiologist. What I do for cardiac MRI is very different from what I do from vas for vascular CT. And if I were to put AI in those two um, different interpretation processes, I would want to interact with them differently. And so that's just for one radiologist in one portion of a large academic practice. As you look at big practices that are spread across uh, wide regions of geography and covering different specialties, you know, you get a lot of variation in this. And so it's something that has to be thought about carefully because the other thing to think about too is how does the radiologist interact with the AI? Is it a static result that shows up in packs and they choose to look at it or not look at it and report it or not report it? Do they have to interact with the results and, and, and actually you know, click a button to say, yes, I agree, no, I don't agree. Do they actually want to modify the post-processing and maybe re-trigger the inference engine again? So there, there are so many different possible ways that, that I uh, could interact with an AI as a radiologist. And, and again, that's where the use cases become so important because for each different use case, you may want a different type of interactivity. The other thing to consider is where does that AI result go? Does it go in PACS? Does it not go in PACS? Does it go in the radiology report? How does it get there? For us in the US, medical legal considerations are always uh, part of any decision making process. And so, you know, would we archive these results as part of the medical record? If it's not in the medical record, it may as well not have happened. And so that's a, a decision that also has to come into play. I really like this paper from Dr. Mazarowski. I, I cite it often when I talk about AI, um, partly because it's a, it has a very provocative title, but it is a very nice thoughtful uh, discussion of maybe some of the not so fun parts of this AI and radiology consideration. Um, but I would, I like to, to try to take a positive spin on it, which is yes, this is a disruption, but I also think it's a, it's an opportunity for us to positively disrupt and rethink the way that we deliver care. And that's, that's not necessarily a bad thing. And so if you're interested in, in some of the discussion, I encourage you to, to read Dr. Mazarowski's paper. 
Another real world consideration to think about with uh, with radiology AI is automation bias, you know, assuming that the AI is always more correct than the human. And this often is going to come down to inexperience or, or unfamiliarity with either the technology or with radiology. You know, more and more, I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that there will be a generation of radiologists in the future that will never have practiced radiology without the use of AI. Um, I am of the generation that never practiced without PACs. Um, if, you know, it's not terribly relevant to radiology, but I've also never driven a car with a manual transmission, right? I wouldn't know how to, I've never learned. And so if you think about that in the context of, of AI, how do we teach the future radiologists that we're training uh, to use this technology? For that matter, how do we teach our colleagues to use this technology? How do we learn ourselves? Because you might think that the, the inclination to think that the computer is right could come from the fact that we don't necessarily uh, feel comfortable with making that decision ourselves. And so there's, there's certainly a real risk for, for automation bias. And sort of the corollary of that is that as we monitor the performance of the AI and we identify these areas where we disagree with the decision that it produces, how do we provide that feedback? So we have to teach others about AI. We have to teach our future generation with AI, but we also have to teach the AI itself. Uh, and so more and more the tools that we're deploying in the workflow are going to come with this capability to actually provide feedback. And it's going to be important to understand what the model does with that feedback and how it incorporates that into future performance. There's also the risk of data drift, which is just a natural phenomenon, right? Eventually things are going to change over time compared to the way they were when the AI was initially deployed. And that could be because a practice gets new equipment, they start doing new kinds of procedures, they start to change the way they were performing exams in the past, uh, different patient populations are cared for. And so one thing we don't really have a great sense of is what is the, the lifespan of a model after deployment? You know, how often are we going to need to update these models? Uh, when, you, when you buy packs, you buy packs for at least a decade. It's no small feat to install a new packs and remove an old one. Uh, what's it going to be like for an AI model? Surely the lift is going to be less, but are we going to be needing to do this every two years? Or are we going to have, you know, five to 10 years? And it's hard to know, but it also factors into the, the return on investment calculation and the, the budget question as well. So at the end of the day, remember the goal is not to create a robot radiologist or a robot physician. It's to take the parts of what we do and automate the parts that don't require a human's attention to make us better human physicians and better expert physician readers. You know, and this can touch all parts of the workflow of the, of the process of the patient moving through the radiology practice, right? It can make image acquisition time better, which makes for a better patient experience. It can improve measurement accuracy, which makes for better radiologist and patient experience ultimately. It can do some of those repetitive tasks that computers are very good at that humans are not as good at and help us to focus our efforts where we can contribute most effectively. So I wanna spend a little bit of time specifically talking about some aspects of, of healthcare in the US that impact radiology AI. And uh, in part, they have to do with these agencies and this legislation. So the FDA is the Food and Drug Administration uh, it regulates medical devices in the US. And right now that also includes uh, AI software that might be placed into the radiology workflow. Uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, is responsible for reimbursement of patients that are covered under those two programs, Medicare and Medicaid, but also indirectly and somewhat directly plays a, a big role in how private insurers choose to reimburse how much and what for. Then there's HIPAA, which is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. And uh, HIPAA includes a privacy rule and a security rule that have to do with uh, protected health information, patient information, and how it is disclosed, how it is handled. And so that comes into play in uh, training and evaluating AI as well. So let's talk a little bit more about each of these. 
So the FDA, as I said, regulates medical devices. There are three uh, classes of medical devices, classes one, two, and three. And so the higher the number, the, uh, the stronger potential impact the device ha can have on a patient's health and, and therefore the more closely those are regulated. Um, 510k clearance is typically for class one and class two devices, and it requires the vendor to demonstrate that the device is at least as good as, a, as one that is already on the market from a safety and effectiveness standpoint. It does require a significant amount of data, but it doesn't necessarily require clinical trials. Uh, a class three device is, is one that can directly impact the health of a patient. So something that's implanted or something that is used on a patient. And those typically require clinical trials data, uh, a very thorough evaluation for evidence of safety and effectiveness. And then there's a, a relatively newer uh, option, which is the de novo pathway. Uh, and this is granted when and they specifically use the word granted. They don't use clearance or approval because they're designating this as a different option. Uh, this is granted when there is no equivalent device or technology on the market. And so the FDA does a risk-based risk -based assessment of the uh, device to uh, decide if they're going to grant this de novo pathway designation. Now, interestingly, uh, towards the end of the prior administration in the US, prior to the current administration in the US, there was uh, some discussion that was begun as to whether or not the FDA would need to regulate all uh, software, medical software, and particularly a certain types of AI uh, software as we might use in radiology. Now, there was no final decision made on this, so we're all sort of sitting and waiting to understand what this might look like in the future, but, but this might change. And there was, um, there was some initial discussion between the Food and Drug Administration and the, um, the um, Health and Human Services folks. And so, as I said, we, we don't have an answer yet, but there, there may be change coming in the future related to this. But for now, there are uh, some FDA cleared AI tools throughout medicine. Uh, this graphic is a little over a year old now, uh, dates to pre-pandemic, but you can see here the teal colored uh, apps are the radiology apps, so fairly higher number of radiology apps compared to individual categories elsewhere in medicine. And most of these, uh, even though this is listed as approvals, most of these were actually 510k clearances um, and had not undergone clinical trials. Again, a very nice resource available on the uh, ACR's DSI website for FDA cleared AI models that uh, is actively updated. Uh, as of yesterday, when I looked, there are 115 total. You can see there was a, quite a jump in the number of approvals that happened last year, and we're just a little bit into 2021. So of course that's uh, ongoing data. Uh, of the 115, there are about, uh, two-thirds that are a combination of brain, lung, and breast applications. Uh, of that 115, about half of them work on CT data, about 20% work on MR data, and uh, a dozen or so each for x-ray and ultrasound. So quite a predominance to the, um, the CT and MR end of the, of the spectrum here. As far as reimbursement, and I mentioned that you know return on investment is a is, is a consideration uh, here in in adding on this technology. There is uh, something that CMS has called an NTAP, a new technology add-on payment, and it requires the technology to, as the name suggests, be new. It has to be less than three years old. Um, typically, that means that. 510k clearance is perhaps less likely because that would imply that there's something else already in existence. Uh, it has to not be covered by pre-existing reimbursement paradigms. So we have in the inpatient setting uh, this concept of, of diagnosis-related uh, groups, DRGs, that uh, dictate a single reimbursement for a particular diagnosis. And however, that's parceled out in the course of giving the patient's care um, is, is how it's used. And if it's exceeded, then you don't end up getting more money. So it has to be a, a cost that is not currently covered. And it has to demonstrate substantial clinical improvement. So it has to improve patient outcomes. 
And this, this option is only available for three years. It's evaluated every year after, after CMS issues it. And so after that time, there has to be a new mechanism. This is not something you can use for, for um, perpetuity as it were. And so in the fall, we were all a little bit surprised when CMS issued uh, an NTAP for radiology AI specifically for detection of large vessel occlusion on CT. Uh, and the, um, the vendor that earned this, and again, not naming any names, but was able to show decreased time to intervention for the patient and, and an improvement in patient outcomes. And so this applies not only to, to that vendor, but to any vendor that can say that they have an equivalent product. So this certainly changes the, the reimbursement uh, uh, scene, at least in the short term. Again, this is only valid for up to three years and it's reevaluated every year. So we're sort of in that first year time period to see uh, how this changes things, whether what there are new ones that are, that are issued as well. Finally, the other um, aspect of, of healthcare in the US that we are uh, always conscious of is uh, HIPAA, which again is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. And uh, HIPAA dictates the privacy and security of protected health information and what can be used, what can be disclosed. They suggest two approaches for de-identification, either this expert determination uh, approach or the one that most of us typically uh, use, which is the safe harbor system by which you remove uh, 18 types of patient identifiers, sort of the obvious things you can think of like name, age, date of birth, um, or also things that are somewhat less common like vehicle identification number, um, uh, photographs, other kinds of account numbers, things you may not necessarily always find in, in radiology data, but could find elsewhere in the medical record. Um, and that after that removal, that there's no way to actually re-identify the patient. And so we typically follow the safe harbor, um, sort of a related concept in, in AI research is who owns the data and who has the ability to share the data in its de-identified form. For, for those of you uh, in Europe, certainly you now have GDPR, which gives patients uh, the option to uh, consent to use of their data. Uh, in Canada, it is typically the performing entity that is considered to own the data, although there is some variation from province to province. And in the US, primarily it is, it is considered that the, um, the performing entity uh, owns the data. But if you actually dig a little bit deeper, um, it's, it's not quite that straightforward. And, and admittedly, this is, this is a graphic now from 2015. So some of this may have changed, but there, is, there was at that time only one state in the country, the state of New Hampshire, which had legislation that specified that the patient owns their medical record or the information in their medical record. Uh, the states colored here in purple, about half of the rest of the country, either the hospital or the um, physician owns the medical record. And then in the rest of the country, there's actually not any specific statement one way or the other. Uh, there's new legislation called the 21st Century Cures Act signed in 2016, taking effect very soon that again, doesn't explicitly address this question of ownership, but does make data more readily available to patients to help increase engagement in their care. So we still don't have an answer necessarily um, but related to all of these, uh, these topics, both the economic piece of it, the regulatory piece of it, there are a number of very nice webinars in the SIM AI webinar series that are available if you're interested in learning more. So for the last portion of the presentation, what I wanted to do was take you through our experience a little bit uh, of um, how we have approached this over the last couple of years and what we've learned um, reminding you again of the sort of lifespan of AI and radiology, if you will, and everything starts over here in the pre-deployment stage. Some things make it all the way to post-deployment, not everything does, but everything that even moves in that direction moves at a very different speed. And I will start this final portion of the talk with the disclaimer that we are one site, we are a very large academic medical center on the East Coast in a big I think beautiful city in the US, in Philadelphia. Um, so all of that sort of is my, is my disclaimer to, to, the, um, to the advice that follows. But what I'm trying to share with you here, I think are concepts that uh, would apply even in different practice settings and different environments. 
And the first I mentioned already, really, which is involve all the stakeholders early. You know, what we ended up finding as we started down this road was that there were multiple processes happening in parallel, um, different domain experts that had wanted to deploy an AI in the clinical workflow and, and all took sort of different approaches to it. And as a result, ended up not getting the resources that they needed because they didn't know who to talk to and where to go. And so we created a steering committee that evaluates all of these requests and consists of physicians, both radiology and non-radiology, data scientists, our IT and informatics experts, our administration, um, and represent, representation because we are a large organization from not just within our department, but from across the organization. Uh, and we involve our clinical champions early and often in this process. And uh, if there are domain experts that are not necessarily part of the core committee, they are invited regularly to participate in these conversations. And it just makes everything uh, a little bit easier when, when everyone is involved from the beginning. Again, really a related lesson, which is involving IT early, but particularly information security, because you might need hardware, whether it comes from the vendor, whether it comes from your individual practice. Um, there may be specific security concerns. And again, because we are a big organization, these are actually laid out outside of our department. And so um, there is a group that is uh, dedicated to actually evaluating these requests. Uh, but had we, you know, had, in the instances where we didn't engage them early, it actually held up the process. Uh, you know, in terms of equipment, is it going to be equipment that's on your premises, an on-prem server versus something that sits in the cloud? And if it's in the cloud, then you have de-identification issues for us. And so uh, we tend to de-identify all of our data, regardless of whether it's going out to the cloud or staying uh, on-prem just to, to maximize um, patient uh, privacy and, and data safety. Uh, and, you know, in some cases, these are internal research tools rather than um, external vendor tools. Again, because we're a big academic place, we have researchers that are developing tools that they want to evaluate. And so in some cases, when everything originates internally, it's a little bit easier, in some cases not. And so, again, engaging, engaging IT and information security early has been critical for us. Um, knowing what the goal of the evaluation is, this is something that we uh, didn't uh, consider early on, you know, is it, is it, are we doing research with this AI tool? Are we trying to do a clinical evaluation to decide whether or not we want to buy it? Are we technically doing both? And that is a, another layer of complexity. Um, but it dictates perhaps who gets involved and, and at what stage in the process. And certainly if you're looking to buy an AI solution that, that begs the question of budget and financial resources and contracts that need to be signed for both the research and the clinical evaluation. So if possible, it's, it's helpful to, to know uh, ahead of time what the ultimate goal is. And admittedly, sometimes that might change along the way, but to the best of, uh, of one's ability to, to know what the goal is, it's helpful to define that upfront. Uh, the data sharing question and, and access to the data after the evaluation or even during the evaluation, you know, will you be sharing data with an external vendor? What are the parameters around them using that data, whether for while you evaluate their tool or even after that? Uh, is the vendor paying you for that data? So, so this is where you get into a lot of cultural, ethical, maybe even policy considerations, and, and, but it's important to have those conversations and, 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 and make sure that that's done again as early as possible because you don't wanna run into a situation after the fact where you didn't realize that a vendor could continue to use your data after your collaboration with them. Uh, it's best to, to know what that arrangement is upfront. And I'll just point out that, that all of that still has to do with pre-deployment. Uh, and so, you know, this is this, it tends to feel sometimes like these things take forever to move from one step to the next, but that it really in part is because there's so much that has to happen at this first stage. So, you know, after spending all that time on the pre-deployment, you figure, well, the deployment should be easy, right? And, and sometimes it is, and sometimes it's not. And uh, it's important to make sure again, that if you've got all the stakeholders engaged and you know how the system has to communicate with what other systems, where the interoperability needs are, 
uh, what the data connections are going to have to be, what the hardware configuration needs to be, some user interface testing ahead of time, all of that can contribute to resources that you need for the actual deployment, actually being able to, to plug all the connections to one another and flip a switch, essentially. And then you get to post-deployment monitoring. And uh, again, this is gonna depend on whether you've got a, an FDA cleared vendor tool for us and, and whether we're using it in the clinical environment for patient care and actually thinking about buying a product. So you're thinking about the evaluation from that standpoint, or it's a research evaluation. Again, very different considerations. And um, it's important to think about the metrics of success if you know, you're doing this to potentially buy something because you wanna collect the data that's gonna help inform that decision by the end and not get to the end of an evaluation and think, hmm, I can't really make this decision because I don't have the data that I need. And that includes surveying the users, you know, the user experience of this. Did this increase efficiency? Did this decrease error? Did it decrease turnaround time? All of those metrics can be, can be valuable in addition to just the strict metrics about the model's performance itself. And, and lastly, especially for the research evaluation, it's important to collect all of the data you might need and not get to the end of the process and realize that you might have to reprocess a substantial number of cases to get the right data because there's something missing that someone wants to analyze and, and it's not available because the right switch wasn't turned on or the right data wasn't sent to the right destination. So, so in conclusion, there certainly are unique aspects to healthcare in the US that inform everything we do in terms of regulation and legislation. Um, but I hope that some of the lessons that I've shared are still relevant. Uh, and uh, we certainly learned a great deal in the process and I hope that the information was helpful to you as well. Uh, you know, the, the trend in the last couple of years has certainly been to portray this uh, as a very adversarial relationship between radiology and AI, but I, I much prefer the, uh, the cooperative approach. And I think there's real promise for, for this technology. Uh, and you know there are certainly challenges as we've seen, and especially as we try to deploy these uh, in the real world and outside the lab environment, but uh, there's great potential for this technology to change the way we deliver care and improve the way we deliver care. And uh, it's our collective responsibility to deploy it safely and effectively. So thank you so much again for, for inviting me to speak today. I see lots of questions here in the chat and the Q&A. Um, so Daniel and Pinar, yeah. I'll let you guys guide me as do you want me to just go through these or do you want to direct me to a certain place? How sure, no, so I, I tried to, to kind of group the questions together because it was really amazing to see how many people were interested uh, and were discussing in the chat. So. Maybe there are some broad topics that emerged, and I think maybe one of the first we could try to discuss um, was raised by many was about like the broad topic of trust, let's say. So there were questions like, what would be the best way to gain a so, oh, so that radiologists have trust in the AI? How can that be done? Should rigorous clinical trials be required? Um, how do we broaden trust to, towards AI within the community and kind of this tackling of post-deployment issues? So I, I think that's a broad topic that raised, was raised. So maybe what's, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you could probably, you know, spend an hour just talking uh, about that. I, I, think, I think more information is really is, is the ticket to, to gaining trust, you know, this, we need to get away from this sort of black box approach or really a black box perception, right? Because we know a lot of the AI out there um, has some explainable component to it now compared to what it did at the beginning. But, um, you know, for, for those of us that spend a lot of time thinking about this, this, there may be, we, we may be satisfied with maybe a slightly slightly less information because there's, we have more understanding of what the technology is actually doing. But if you're putting it out in the real world, you know, give the, give the user radiologist as much information about what the AI used in the images or in the report data or in the EMR to encourage them that it is actually working properly or to help them identify situations where maybe it's not working properly. Um, and so I think the, the trust issue really can be addressed and should be addressed 
by trying as much as possible not to hide what the AI is doing. And, you know, obviously not to reveal the proprietary pieces of, of right. you know, what the, what the network looks like, for example, or, or you know, how the, the hyperparameters were optimized. We don't need to know that stuff, right? We, right. we really need to know where it's looking because we want to know to start with, is that where we would look? Right, right. And I guess this kind of um, leads to the other question uh, that was broadly associated to that topic. So maybe uh, what would be the essential, let's say, yeah, the essential items of knowledge that a radiologist should have about AI in general? Because I think like on the one hand, you could tell them, oh, well, this data has been used and this was maybe there was this particular group lacking or whatever. So they could know if in that specific group it works or not but like I mean this is kind of for us maybe does seem very simple to understand why that should be important but I mean I guess there are probably some radiologists that would have difficulties in understanding why that is actually an issue so kind of would you say that there should be some basic teaching of kind of data manipulation AI stuff just to get them up to speed to understand really what this information means that is provided to them, as you suggested. Yeah, I mean, I think, I certainly don't think it could hurt, you know, to, to not only have an individual AI tool kind of be um, explanatory in terms of what it has done. I apologize, clearly someone has something very important to say to me, which is- No worries. Wait till left, it's not really that important. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, it's just their timing is perfect. Um, <laughs> So, you know, there's, there's two parts to this, right? It's teaching, it's teaching the radiology community how AI works in general, but then also teaching them specifically about the tool that they, or the multiple tools that they may be using, because those are broadly two different lessons, right? I mean, you can, you can present AI as this black box, but really it's a whole ton of sophisticated math. It, there is no magic. There is no, you know, it, it, there, there is... There, there, it, it all comes down to math and calculations and having broadly an understanding of, of how that is done with deep learning and neural networks right. is probably helpful. But right. then more specifically getting into, okay, for this specific tool that's trying to find a pneumothorax, you know, reassure me that not, what it's really not looking for is the chest tube. Right, right. Right, right. Related to this matter, there were there were some questions also on how to contribute uh, to, for example, reference data sets that could be used to evaluate AI tools. What's your opinion on that? Um, yeah, so you know, I I'll, I'll be honest, I didn't cover that a whole lot. Although there are multiple efforts um, underway, uh, even most recently related to COVID. You know, there's a a big um, uh, effort in the U.S. right now with, I think, actually some international collaboration as well called MIDRIC. It's the uh, Medical Imaging Data and Resource Consortium. Um, multiple radiology societies represented multiple sites looking at different aspects of COVID and AI. Um, and as part of that, there is a big uh, data, data registry that's being developed. There's also the RSNA's effort, uh, RICORD, which is kind of a, 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 a um, complementary effort and also the ACR's effort uh, uh, called CIRR, which is the COVID Imaging Resource Registry. Not sure about that first R there, but these are all complementary efforts and those are just related to COVID. You know, there are other smaller efforts certainly uh, and um, it is one of the ways to get to creating uh, sort of benchmarks essentially you know if they're if you're developing for example a lung nodule uh, AI a lung nodule detection AI and you can benchmark it against an established data set standard that exists that other lung nodule AI tools are also benchmarked against and then we as the consumers can say well that tool has an accuracy of 75 percent but this tool has an accuracy of 95 percent that's something really meaningful um, and again you know with with the um, unique environments both here in the U.S. and then in Europe with data sharing and all of that it gets hard to develop these kinds of benchmarks but I think I think that would be incredibly valuable for for us as consumers of AI and also for for our colleagues in, uh, uh, in industry. Right, right. Yes. 
please, and please there, go, go ahead. Yes, there were some other questions as well related, related to this in the other part of, um, well, I think the implementation part in, uh, for example, reports versus um, an AI tool. Uh, so someone uh, said, well, if you have this radiologist or at his first day and let's, um, how would that first report of that radiologist versus an AI model or tool, uh, yeah, how would that be in clinics? And I'm actually, I had a question myself about how is, what's your vision in that part of um, implementing AI uh, in the clinics in how will it be with the interaction? I mean, this is also a part with the interaction, of course. Um, what's, an, what's the ideal world that we want to be in as radiologists in having AI in our world? Yeah, that's a, that's a, a great question. I mean, I think for me, you know, it has the potential to not only get rid of a lot of inefficiencies in our workflow, but also to perform tasks that a computer would just inherently be better at. And that is not necessarily the entire interpretive process, right? Because we've seen that already. Yeah. But but the, the sort of best case scenario is where the images are acquired. There are a variety of AI tools that, that post-process those images. And then for us as the radiologists, we're not only evaluating the initial reconstructed data, we're now evaluating this sort of cockpit representation, if you will, which is the analogy that, uh, that uh, the Academy of Radiology Research and Biomedical Engineering likes to use, this diagnostic cockpit analogy of all of these different inputs that are, are inputs to the radiologist, outputs from the AI that we then synthesize uh, and maybe we go back to the raw data and we cross check, you know, and we confirm that the, that the, um, that the AI outputs that we agree with the AI outputs and then we issue uh, an interpretation accordingly. Uh, the other thing that, you know, AI has the potential to do when, when performance gets to an acceptable level is to parse out normal versus abnormal. And then where the, for the ones that are complicated, the human radiologist is able to, is able to weigh in. So, um, I think practice in the future, fully AI enabled radiology practice is gonna look very different than it does now, but it's gonna take a while to get there. Yes, I agree. And I think it, an important part is also what you say, AI um, generally is seen as a black box now. Of course, there are some ways to evaluate the algorithm. Uh, another thing is also um, um, in um, there, it's based on a lot of probabilities. And in that sense, you as a radar or as a radiologist making your report, that's also a bunch of probabilities. So you have to combine those. And yeah, I think, I think combining both worlds will improve those probabilities, but yeah, we, we have to see how that will uh, look in clinics, I guess. Uh, yeah, and it'll definitely be sort of an interactive process, you know, it won't just be one set of probabilities independently of the other anymore, you'll have to, as you said, combine them yes. to come up with that final conclusion. Maybe just a, a follow up question to that, because that's something I personally wonder often, um, and I'm sorry that probably many of the questions did not get answered yet, but just to get this question in. I mean, if we were to have AI and we were to review those results and everything, sometimes it feels like this would actually increase workload instead of reducing it. I mean, would, would there be, would, I mean, so would a perfect, if the, if the AI had perfect diagnostic accuracy, obviously we could trust the results and everything, but if it's somewhere below then actually reviewing the AI's results is probably something that takes more time than just viewing the study yourself, what, what, what you think about that? Yeah, and, and that's the danger, right? And so that's where in order for this to really be successful, the, the model performance has to be to a clinically uh, appropriate threshold uh, for us to get to that point in the, in the future where most of what we're reviewing is actually from the AI rather than from the, the reconstructed images themselves. But there are some cases, you know, we, we do this already, right? I mean, I, 
uh, I, you know, I, I measure a lot of aortas in the course of a clinical day. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't look at the thin client software and say, okay, I know you're telling me that's 4.5 centimeters, but how can I be sure that your centimeter is really a centimeter? You know, we don't do stuff like that. No, no. no. So we will get to that point in the future, but it'll take time to get there. And I think yeah. that will be how we get over that that potential, and there probably will be some inefficiency early on, which is why there's been slow adoption as well. Right, maybe about the adoption, just one of the last questions, because this was a topic that emerged twice. And um, so there were some people asking about how to integrate that. What do you think, would, would it be kind of a central hub that distributes uh, the images from the packs to the various AI softwares, gets the results back or, um, or and, and it, would that be something feasible for a small practice or what, what would, would be the ways on how to really integrate that depending on what type of practice you're working in? And, and I think a little bit you answered your own question because it is going to depend on the practice environment and even within you know our, our academic space there are different practice environments and there are different workflows um, but I think you know we will have to rethink what Uh, radiology workstation looks like, right? Because now we load up packs, we load up our reporting software, and what we're the the danger is to try to sort of shoehorn AI into that current paradigm. But I think honestly, what we're going to have to do is rethink the paradigm, um, especially right. as more and more of these AI tools uh, become part of our workflow, because because it, it will require us to essentially, as, as Dr. Mazeroski says, you know, disrupt it and, and start over. And I think that's part of the exciting and also, you know, anxiety provoking part of all of it. Right, right. I don't know, Pina, any more questions from your side? Not from my side, but I think, yeah, as you said, Daniel, there are a lot of still questions also coming in the chat yeah. box. <laughs> Well, my, uh, my Twitter handle is here on the slide. If anyone would like to uh, message me, I'm happy to continue the conversation uh, right. uh, after the webinar as well. Right, I guess that's a, that's an awesome uh, yeah suggestion. So, um, yes. everybody, thank thank you very much for uh, for having joined us for this really incredible webinar. I, I liked it very much personally, and I think. Uh, Like the reactions we got in the chat and the Q and really show that this is a topic that many are interested in. Um, so I guess, yeah, thank you very much, Tessa, for uh, having been here with us. It was really a pleasure. Uh, thanks, of course, to our sponsor, Braco, for uh, supporting us with these webinar series. And um, I guess, yeah, just following up on Twitter or um, in the discussion on our YouTube channel uh, sometime soon, um, I guess would be the thing to, yeah, continue the dis dis discussion and uh, thanks everybody and uh, we'll see you next month i guess thank you thank, thank you, you.